I hope you're doing well. Um, I want to take a little more time today to look at Psalm 51, which was David's beautiful um, song of confession and repentance before the Lord. Um, in verse number four, he said, Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Um, I started thinking about that a little bit more and I was thinking that, you know, it isn't just, I mean, God is the 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 eternal judge. So in, in that sense, he had sinned against the only one who has the rights to judge him. But the scripture also tells us that um, we can sin against ourselves and, and, and there can be consequences that affect people that we care about. So both are true. Um, and I wouldn't want anyone to misunderstand that point. Uh, Paul tells the Corinthians that when you uh, go into that, that sexual sins are sins against your own body. So um, it's not that we just we sin against a person, we sin against God as the eternal judge, but our sin is sometimes against ourselves and the hurt we cause, um, the, the consequences that we live with, and then um, against others whose relationships we destroy. In verse 13, he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Um, there are some people, I think, who understand the, the, the new covenant and the grace of God who take a negative view towards the idea of repentance and confession as though they were parts of the Old Testament law and had no part to play in our relationship with Christ. And I really couldn't disagree with them more because I think... It's limiting the, the full impact of what repentance is. Repentance is to change your mind. It's to change about your mind about how you live. And when we catch ourselves as Christians and disciples of Jesus Christ with attitudes or actions that are contrary to our new nature, it's important for us to repent. It, it, it may have nothing to do with an emotion um, or some sacrifice that we make or hurting ourselves. Like um, we have seen people punish their own bodies or try to get them under control. Nothing like that. But a clear recognition that, man, that, that behavior doesn't match what he made me to be. So I need to put on the Holy Spirit. I need to put on the 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 life of Christ, which is righteousness, which is for my good. And confession, I talked about it a little bit last time, it's just saying the same thing as God. It, but it allows us, that confession gives us the empowerment to, to do the repentance so that we can rejoice once again. In the, the second part of uh, Psalm 51, he, he says, listen, I, you do these things for me, God, and I'm going to proclaim your goodness. I'm going to tell sinners the way to return to you. Forgive my blood guilty. Now he was guilty, <coughs> but God was forgiving him. He'd already been given, told that he was forgiven by the prophet Nathan. He goes, but he goes, I will sing and I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. You see, when we're sharing the gospel, all we're doing is proclaiming the good news 
the goodness of God, the greatness of his love. And that's why I like to remind people, it is the goodness of God that teaches men to deny ungodliness. It's the grace of God, not the, not the wrath of God. The grace of God draws men to Christ, teaches them to do the right thing. It's his goodness. So we proclaim that to a world that's hurting and self-destructing because of um, living a self-driven life. They think that uh, all of the sin is going to make them happy and satisfied, but it's just a horrible lie from the enemy. Um, 2 Corinthians seven ten says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So there is a sense in which both the believer, the Christian, the disciple of Christ, and the unbeliever have regret. They look back and, and, they, and, they, and they have regret. But he's saying the difference is one leads to salvation and one produces death. Why is that? Because Romans teaches us that the wages of sin is death. Now, Jesus has died for everyone. He paid the price in full. But if you choose to pursue the evil ways, well, the result is death. Not just physical death, not just eternal separation from God, but a literal experience of hell on earth, if you will, a perishing of the soul. And so he reminds the Corinthians who had quite a bit of trouble <laughs> He says, godly grief produces the repentance. So when the Holy Spirit in us is grieved, don't harden your heart or sear your conscience, but confess that you are a saint and you've been made righteous and are holy and you, you belong to him and it is your desire to do only what pleases him. And then you can say, that's a, that's, a, that's a repentance that leads us into the salvation of God. We're not the authors of salvation. We're the receivers of salvation. God is our salvation. And that's important to remember. Second Timothy, at the end of Paul's life, in chapter 2, verse 19, he starts out and goes, But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So as believers, God knows who's his children. God knows who the genuine disciple is. And he goes, but at the same time, if you name the Lord as Lord, the one who rules and reigns over your heart, then our part is to depart from iniquity. Anything that is sinful, lustful, um, which dishonors him. He goes on and he talks about the vessels in the great house. He says, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as wholly useful to the master of the house. So here it is. We're before the Lord. And we know that we struggle with temptations, and with attitudes and actions that are not honoring to him. We confess, Lord, you have made me yours. You live in me. Lord, cleanse out everything that doesn't fit. Everything that doesn't belong to me as a child of God. Would you... Show me so I can root it out, so I can cleanse it, so I can live true to my true nature. Psalm 51 is something everybody should read over and over again because it teaches us the beauty of repentance, the beauty of confession, because David knew the Lord. He knew the Lord in intimacy, and that's how he could write this psalm. As we go back to 2 Samuel, we're going to see the consequences of that sin were not finished. And so 
I hope you have a great day, that you abide in his love, that you'll remind yourself what is true of you as a child of God, and that you'll let him continue his work of sanctification in your life to bring about cleansing so that he's cleansed us and we experience that. We've been sanctified and we're being sanctified, which is a greater entering into that intimate relationship with him. Hear his voice, confess what is true, and have a heart of surrender to say, Lord, whatever you want, it's yours, because I belong to you. And we'll see miraculous, wonderful things happen in our lives. And our, our witness will be emboldened to others. Have a great day.